Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation to come here. And also, just to briefly introduce myself, I'm by training an animal breeder, but I, I recently spent a year at CIMIT, where I, I really enjoyed learning a lot about, or I didn't learn a lot, but I attempted to learn a lot about plant breeding, and it's been really an interesting journey to, to try and understand what's going on there. Um, so, I guess I, I uh, was aware that a lot of people were going to talk about genomic selection in plant breeding, so I thought I would tell something from the animal breeding space, uh, and particularly because a research project that I was involved in myself reached an important milestone in September of last year, where uh, genomic selection was implemented routinely in, in the largest breeding program globally, animal breeding program globally. So in some senses that says, uh, at least from the animal breeding perspective, uh, genomic selection, what have we now achieved as a community? Well, I think we, we know how to get good accuracy. We understand the mechanics of genomic selection. We know how to make it cheap and routine. We have a very good recipe, I believe. And then given we have this good recipe, some things really merge going forward. And then with those things that really merge, what should we do? And, and my talk attempts to, to discuss those things. So in animal breeding, we talk a lot about the Mendelian sampling term. And simply, if we have this uh, sire, for example, here, who produces these four uh, half sibs, we can see the Mendelian sampling of the sire is, is represented here, where we just it's the, the sampling of the parental haplotypes, or the sampling of the sire haplotypes. And it's the reason, for example, if this is me and this is my brother, the reason that we do not look the same is because due to this Mendelian sampling. And it is really the accuracy and the time taken to evaluate this Mendelian sampling term that drives the rate of genetic progress in breeding programs, and that includes breeding programs in, in animals and in plants. And traditionally, in, in livestock breeding at least, the way we did genetic evaluations was using the pedigree, uh, the, uh, just the relationship between individuals captured by the pedigree. And that simply captures the expectation. So, for example, if we take this individual, this is the, pedigree, the relationship matrix for this, this set of four individuals. And if we take uh, you know, this individual here, it's got the same relationship with each of its, its half sibs, which, because we do not have any information about his Mendelian sampling. And in fact, we have distributions about this. We have, with genomics, we can capture the realized deviations about these expectations. And that's depicted here, where we have the same genomic relationship matrix for these individuals. And if we take this individual here, for example, it is less related than we would expect according to pedigree, and this individual is more related than what we would expect according to pedigree. And and we have, you know, these these uh, realized genomic relationships are, you know, they have a normal distribution about their expectation. And it's these deviations from expectation that we use when we're doing genomic prediction, regardless of whatever the model is, if it's GBLOP, ridge regression, Bayes A, etc. It just boils down to, to these deviations from expectation. And if we take that. We want to predict the breeding value of this individual using these two phenotypes, for example. And if this individual has a high phenotype, if this individual has a low phenotype, then we would expect the breeding value of the individual we want to predict to be high, because it is more related to the individual that has a high phenotype and less related to the individual that has a low phenotype. Of course, when we do real prediction, we accumulate lots of these, uh, these relationship coefficients. So traditional livestock breeding it was essentially a large recurrent selection scheme. Uh, in which response to selection depends entirely on the time to evaluate the Mendelian sampling term, the accuracy of the Mendelian sampling term, uh, the, the intensity, or how many Mendelian sampling terms do we evaluate when we are selecting a certain number of individuals to become the parents of the next generation, and that's essentially driven by cost, and the variance in those Mendelian sampling terms. If we have a lot of variation in those Mendelian sampling terms, we can make a lot of genetic progress. Um, so traditionally we did this, although we used the mechanics of, of BLOP, used through pedigree information, what really drove the predictions was progeny tests. So for example, if you had a, a breeding program, you might have 100 candidate bulls per year. You would mate these bulls to 100 cows who would produce 50 daughters. You would milk those daughters for a year. And the, essentially, the breeding value of the Mendelian sampling term of each of these bulls is, is approximately or related to the, the mean of the, of the yield of these 50 daughters. So this is obviously expensive. I think it takes, costs about $30,000 to evaluate a progeny test for one bull. It takes five years, uh, and the accuracy is not one. For example, we can, if we just do one year of progeny test, we would only have heifer milk production, which is not the same as lifetime milk production or lifetime profitability. So we want to select on a huge a range of traits, because we're doing recurrent selection. So we want to s increase the total economic merit of the, animal, of the population uh, simultaneously. So progeny test is not ideal. 
So genomic selection was really exciting because it really directly addresses three of the four key components for making this genetic gain. So we can shorten the time because previously it took us five years to evaluate this Mendelian sampling term. Now we can do it as soon as the animal is born. We can genotype the animal, which means we can have a breeding value for it before it reaches puberty. So we can select without almost any time loss. We can also have a much higher selection intensity because the costs of genotyping even if you genotype that $100 is an awful lot less than $30,000 for a progeny test. And the accuracy can in fact actually be higher, and it is higher, um, if, if we do the data, do the analysis properly. So we're, not only are we shorting the cycle, but we're getting more accuracy. So I think I'm the second person that's suffering from a, a transfer from a Mac. But uh, this is uh, essentially a summary of what has been achieved in, in the breeding program that I was working in and then also in the poster boy breeding program, which is the U.S. dairy evaluation. So these were the accuracy of the breeding values of our selection candidates prior to doing genomic selection at puberty, so not very high. After we did genomic selection or incorporated genomic selection, we increased these accuracies to, to these numbers, which is a dramatic increase. Most of this increase is, in, is the increase in the Mendelian sampling term accuracy, and it's that Mendelian sampling term that drives genetic progress. This was in the proof of concept stage of that project, where the total number of phenotypes in our training set was quite small. It's much higher now, so these numbers are considerably higher. And an example of what those numbers might be is from the U.S. Uh, Holstein evaluation, which is the largest evaluation globally, and probably, I don't know what the exact numbers are now, because they're, obviously they're always updating, uh, but they have order of tens of thousands of individuals phenotyped and genotyped, and if they were doing evaluations in the old way with pedigree information, they would have an accuracy of 0.55, so no eva that is mean, means they can estimate the mid-parent mean quite well, but they have no information on the Mendelian sampling term at puberty, but now with genomics, the accuracy is, is much higher, and most of this increase in accuracy is, is accuracy in Mendelian sampling term. So I think Gary used, in my humble opinion, so I have used, this is just my conjecture about what we have learned about genomic prediction uh, and how to implement genomic selection in breeding programs. First of all, I think the most important lesson we learned in animal breeding was how to design a training population. This is really important. And what the primary driver of this is the relationships between the training set and the prediction set. There is some interaction between this first uh, factor and the second factor, which is the size of that prediction set. There's also an interaction with heritability of the trait and some random sampling. Uh, so th these factors all interact. I think we have established that uh, marker density beyond 10,000 markers does not affect how we do genomic selection currently. It will affect how we do genomic selection in the future, but in the current model, with the accuracies that are currently being achieved, beyond 10,000 markers doesn't matter. The statistical model does not matter, despite it being a major research topic in, in animal breeding, with many papers published, except one particular model that is ideally suited to merging historical data and future data. The level of linkage disequilibrium essentially doesn't matter, and we can that is a debatable issue. But what really drives prediction is, is linkage information, so essentially the correlation between QTL and markers within a family, or very close to, a set of very closely related individuals. I think we've also learned how to validate breeding values, and in the old days in animal breeding programs, this actually wasn't done, at least to the level at which is done now with genomic information. So this is just uh, some work we did to, to quantify the impact of relationships uh, between the training set and the prediction set. So we had a data set with something like 3,000 uh, individuals, uh, which were genotyped and phenotyped, and we had something like 600 candidates that we wanted to predict the breeding values for. So if you like, the size of the training set is constant. It's the same training set, so the ME or the LD in that training set is constant. But we had a huge range in the accuracy of the resulting breeding values of the individual we wanted to predict, from very low of order 0.1 uh, to, to very high where we're explaining a large proportion of the Mendelian sample. And we said, well, what could be driving that? So what we did was we got, let's say, the top individual. We went to the training set. We found its 10 most closely related individuals. We calculated the average relationship of those individuals to the individual we want to predict, and we found that there was an extremely high R-square between that metric and the accuracy, such that if I'm an individual who has 10 full SIBs in the training set, I get an accuracy of 0.8. If, I have, uh, if I'm an individual who has 10 half SIBs in the training set, I get an accuracy of, of, of uh, a, a moderate accuracy. If I have 10 cousins in the training set, I get a low accuracy, and if I have less than 10 cousins in the training set, I'm really in trouble. Uh, of course, this was just one data set which had uh, 
3,000 individuals. If we had more individuals in the data set, the, the shape or the, you know, this, this part of the line would move up and, and this would sort of, the, the curve would change a little bit. So there is some interaction, but, but this was a clear message how important relationships are. So we also learned how to validate. And if we take a simple example here, uh, so we're always trying to validate the Mendelian sampling term. How early and fast we can predict this Mendelian sampling term because it is only that that drives our rate of genetic progress. And if we have these two families, so for example in crops this could be a biparental population, let's say one family and another biparental population here. And if we just calculate the randomly partition our data and do random cross-validation, ignoring the fact that there are two families in here, we could get a really high accuracy in our estimated breeding values. We could think that our genomic prediction accuracy is 0.9 or, or even almost 1. But then if we look inside the families and we calculate the correlation only inside the families, we see it's zero. So we're not doing any, we have no accuracy for our Mendelian sampling, but we're doing a really good job telling the breeder what the breeder already knows, which is that we have two families here. And the extreme, you know, taking that to a next level, you could have structure or breeding groups here. So this could be one breeding group, this could be another breeding group. And again, you know, we can make good predictions of where the lines come from, but no predictions within the lines. And I think this has been a, a real problem in, in validation of genomic breeding values. And why it's important is because if our prediction accuracy, and for, take this, could be a heat map of a typical breeding program, and we see there's strong structure, and if our accuracy is 0.9, if we do a random cross-validation, but within any of the families within these populations, the accuracy is zero, so we are essentially really well predicting the structure effects. What we, and if we select on that, what we will essentially do is pull out the, the population or the family that has the highest mean and throw away all other di diversity we have in our breeding program. And that's really a risk because a lot of effort has been invested over the years trying to improve these populations and there's good genetic diversity in them. And you don't want to just use genomics blindly and throw that data, throw that diversity away. Which is why we need to do population improvement rather than what we would, I would call population replacement. Um, so, but it, it might feel uh, perhaps negative if, if we say these uh, prediction accuracies that we see in some studies are, are only reflecting structure, so, uh, and, and that there might be some discussion that we can't predict them in even sampling term in crops, but we did some simulations where, where I think uh, several people have done work like this, where we had a, just calculate the accuracy within a single biparental family. So we have some proportion of the biparental family phenotype. These would be predicting the breeding values of F2 individuals, if you like using F2 test cross as half sids or full sids. So uh, we would have some marker density, uh, the different color lines are some increasing number of phenotypes from 5 to 500, and we can get calculating the accuracy within the biparental. There is no structure driving this up, it is entirely accuracy of Mendelian sampling term, and we can get really high accuracy, almost 1. So this gives me a lot of confidence that genomic selection can be very powerful in crops. So just to talk about that simulation a little bit further, so we have uh, our target, what we want to predict, is the breeding value of F2 individuals in a biparental family we're going to call BPX. So we simulated 120 uh, biparentals that are connected to BPX, so 120 by 21 families in total. We had a polygenic trait, we had a large range of phenotype numbers ranging from 5 to 60,000 uh, because we wanted to quantify the extremes. We had a large range of marker densities going from 50 to 100,000 and, and we were always going to evaluate our ability to separate F2 individuals in a biparental. So the ability to tell the breeder something that he doesn't know, not the ability to tell the breeder something that he already knows. So visually this is what this simulation looked like. We have some breeding population of, of say, let's say 200 double haploid parents or candidate parents. From that we make, uh, this will be BPX, and, and we, 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 we just come through a series of biparentals to end up at BPX. Uh, and this is where we were going to do our prediction of breeding values, but we also have 20 biparental families which have paired one in common, another 20 that have paired two in common. We have 10 biparental families for each of the four grandparents, and then we have 40 unrelated biparental populations, albeit they're unrelated in the sense that they're not exotic, they're not from you know, a completely different breeding program, they're from the same breeding pool, so they're nominally unrelated but still in the context of you know, something like the seeds of discovery, these are quite related. So in total we have, let's say, 40 unrelated, 40 moderately related, uh, 40 very closely related, and then the target uh, biparental itself. So this is the figure we had uh, earlier, 
where we're predicting the breeding values of one phenotype F2 individuals using phenotypes only collected from BPX. And basically with 200 markers, we can get the asymptote of prediction. And if we took, for example, 50 phenotypes in that biparental family, we can get uh, you know, quite a 0.6, let's say, uh, accuracy of the Mendelian sampling term. And, and that is really useful for driving genetic progress. And I think Joseph Bayene's results, which have been presented, uh, I think, by uh, Jose and also Prasanna yesterday, you know, th that is, this is why he has such good results. Um, so, okay, that's fine. You might say, well, I don't really want to collect phenotypes inside a biparental because if I have to do that, there's a time penalty. I have to wait for a couple of seasons to get these phenotypes. Uh, and as Gary said, collecting phenotypes inside a biparental is costly. And if you collect them in every biparental, it becomes very costly. So you mightn't necessarily want to do that. So we say, let's collect them from our, our, own, our, our slightly related biparentals. And okay, this is 40 biparentals that have parent, uh, well, 20 that have parent A in common and 20 that have parent B. That's a bit extreme, but it doesn't matter for the purposes of, of discussion. Um, so again, we can get our accuracy of 0.6. So the same level of accuracy we can achieve here with, with uh, sort of 200 markers and 50 phenotypes. We're requiring 800 mar uh, phenotypes and something like 400 markers here. So reducing the relationships, we need more markers and more phenotypes. But this is obviously unrealistic. Having so many biparentals with one population is not real. So you could have the 40 just randomly unrelated individuals from your breeding program, so uh, for unrelated biparentals. So we could have lots of phenotypes collected inside these uh, unrelated families. And if we take this sort of area here, we have something between six and 20,000 phenotypes. And with 10,000 markers, we can get our accuracy of 0.6. So we can do genomic selection, if you like, in two ways. We can do it here with a small amount of phenotypes and a small amount of markers, but with a massive time penalty. We can do it here with um, you know, a moderate amount of markers, but perhaps lots of phenotypes. But I think in the grand scheme of things, 6,000 phenotypes is not huge. I think this is a more, in the longer term, this is the way we want to be doing uh, genomic selection because it leads to much more robust predictions. After three generations of recurrent selection inside this family, these accuracies would go to zero because their prediction is being from long linkage blocks and they break down. Here the prediction is coming from LD uh, and, and therefore they have much greater persistency. So, you know, you can do recurrent selection for a, lo a lot of times. And in fact, you could turn your breeding program into just a recurrent selection scheme that if you like, just increases the mean of the parents as fast as you can and have a separate arm of the breeding program that just does product development where you spin in red lines out of that. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to Aaron's talk because I think he, he talks a little bit about the LD and LA conflict. So if you uh, combine, for example, this data, which is driven from linkage, with this data, which is driven from LD, uh, and Gary alluded to it earlier, you, know, you will have some loss in accuracy. And, and that is true. Our simulations showed the same thing. Um, but I think the argument I would make at least is that, uh, you know, there are models that can partition prediction into its LD component and its LA component. And in the period where you are transitioning from having, you know, this type of data to this type of data, it might be optimal to try and use such types of models. So now a little bit to return to uh, the animal breeding uh, example. So. One of the key components in, in implementing genomic selection was having a really cheap, robust, reliable genotyping platform. And in our pig breeding program, we had a target of $20 per candidate because we were going to do 100,000 candidates genotype per year. If we were to do 60,000 markers on that, it would be $12 million, which is more than what the breeding program can sustain. So we had a target $20 or $22, in fact. Uh, and um, so. Well, it was actually $22, but the, the, essentially the, at the time, the, the cost of a 384 chip was $20. That is now around about $15, and we, we believe we can actually make it cost $11 by doing something subtly different. Um, so we had, you know, in, in, in animal breeding programs, the sires are highly fecund, so they produce lots of offspring, so you can offset the cost of genotyping a sire across all its offspring. So that works out to basically 58 cents to genotype a sire with 60,000 markers. So sires and male ancestors are always genotyped at high density. And then the bit you can play with is what you do with the, the candidates themselves or the dams of the candidates. And if we just genotype the candidates with 384 markers, uh, you know, you'll have the dam when it is a dam at 384, and we can get that down to $20.58 or, or now around what, 15.50. And with that model, we can recover 93% of the variation in high density genotypes. And it turns out that that is more than enough to get really good predictions. But if you weren't happy with that, you could say, oh, I'm going to genotype these guys with 3K instead of 384. You pay almost twice the price. 
And if you're paying twice the price, you can only do half the number of candidates, which means you can only have half the selection intensity. And that's not a good thing. So it turns out it's better to have a low quality genotype and lots of candidates than a, a good genotype and mine. So then what is the recipe for how we did genomic selection in this animal breeding program? Well, I think first of all, there was a clear goal uh, for the, what we were going to use genomic selection for. And crops equivalent, there are many, many similar things. You can use it for recurrent selection of early generation material within a family, across all families. You can do it uh, something uh, with later generations, increasing the efficiency of trials, etc. I, I think because you have to accumulate lots of data, for example, 60,000 phenotypes, you can't do that in one environment or one year. So you have to accumulate data from many environments, many years. So that will naturally invoke a robustness to G by E over time by virtue of genomic selection. It's kind of a, an accidental benefit. You can have a broader breeding, pro uh, breeding goals, hard to measure traits included directly in the selection rather than having to do independent culling at different stages in the breeding program. Um, so um, assuming we have identified a good clear goal for what we're going to use genomic selection for, then we need to do a, a well-designed expensive experiment uh, to prove our hypothesis. And once we have that done, we will make the implementation cheap. We will not try and do these two things together because we might end up with neither working. We need to focus from the start on operational simplicity, and I think Gary was alluding to that earlier. And that's what these guys in the pig breeding program they, was central to their thinking. They also had a very good IT infrastructure. For example, this is a computer, which I don't know how much it costs, but looking at the components, half a million dollars, I would say. Uh, this is the pipeline that was developed to implement the imputation. So just one step in the breeding program, one person spent one year pipelining software. So not developing the software itself, but just pipelining the software. That's now routinely automated. It's all in sync with the, with the rest of what goes on in the breeding program so that no human intervention takes place from the moment the farmer records the phenotype on the farm to when a list is sent back to the farmer of what, what cross he needs to make. So then we have a simple statistical model. So in the old days, we had this set of equations to do genomic pr or to do breeding value prediction where we had this A matrix here. And in the, in the new way of doing things, we just replace A with G. And the amount of... Uh, the, the code for this original software might be, let's say, 80,000 lines, and the amount of modifications to, in, the, in the old code to make it into the new code is, is tiny, less than a few hundred lines of code. So almost no change in the whole operational system aside from pumping in this uh, imputation pipeline. Then we also developed a reliable, consistent, standardized, and cheap genotyping and imputation strategy, and cheap at full economic cost. Uh, so that was based now on 384 markers, which at current full economic costs, according to a, a commercial provider, is $15.50. So the implementation in the pigs, we have, let's say, implemented genomic selection in a large breeding program, which is doing 100,000 candidates per year. So if you like this, in, and this is just my summary of, of what happened, it may not be the summary that you would get from the managers of these companies, or this company, but it's just my opinion. So we started in 2009, uh, the senior managers identified four key projects, a simple statistical algorithm which required one postdoc, it needed to minimize the changes we would, ma we would make to what we were doing routinely, a simple genotype uh, invitation and genotyping strategy that needed to be less than $22, it required one postdoc, uh, an experiment to prove the principle of all of this required one postdoc, it used historical data because there were good databases historically in place and we could just genotype historical data and do our entire research on that data. And then within the company itself, I estimate there were about four people that worked full-time on the, let's call it the infrastructure. So in total, about seven full-time equivalents to go from 2009 to 2013, where breeding, uh, genomically selected pigs were released to the farmers. The accuracy has more than doubled, and validation has confirmed that we're making faster genetic progress. Again, my guess is that the genotype data for the proof of concept experiment cost around about 600,000, and the people time was about seven full-time equivalents. So what next? So uh, we have a breeding program now that can generate 100,000 genotype individuals a year, many tens of thousands of individuals in the training set added each year. A, the predictions are set up to work with linkage information, which is giving us these good predictions. But perhaps there's something more we could do. If we have, let's say, hundreds of thousands of individuals phenotyped and genotyped, if we could sequence those individuals, we could change our predictions from being linkage-derived to being LD, or actually causal variant-derived, to what I'm calling industrial-scale fine mapping. So what would be the benefits of industrial-scale fine mapping? So 
Predictions would not be based on linkage, rather they would be based on direct capture of causal variants. And for example, we could get, let's say, 40% of the polygenetic, polygenic variants finally mapped to its causal mutants. And if we could do that, the simplest thing we could get is more persistent uh, across breed accuracy, if you like. But that's just one thing. And I've got two little examples of how we could think about how we would further be able to benefit, and, and, and I'll talk about those now. So these are just two simple simulations of what we are thinking about doing next now that we have implemented genomic selection. So genome editing, uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It was the nature method of the year, I think, in two or three years ago. And it basically allows us, in an animal breeding context, take a sire that is good but maybe has one bad allele, uh, and we can just fix that allele. So we had a simple simulation which combined genome editing with genomic selection. And you need an acronym when you come up with something, so we, we call it selection with genome editing and genomic selection. Very original. Um, so we have a simulation with 50 generations. We have 1,000 animals per generation. We're going to select 50 sires per generation to become the parents of the next generation. We have a, no, a polygenic trait, so we, we always try and make things work in simulation using polygenic traits, because if we can make it work for a polygenic trait, it will work automatically for a simpler trait. So we have 10,000 QTLs whose effect come from a normal distribution, so no big QTL. And we have between 0 and 20 edits per sire. And uh, here are the results. So it, when we have 0 edits, so we have different numbers of edits here. This is the generations. This is the genetic gain in standard deviations of the trait. So when we have uh, 0 edits, this orange line, that's just genomic selection on its own. Then when we, if we take this one here, if we do 20 edits, which is, okay, at the moment it's probably cost prohibitive, but it's not out of the range of what we might be able to do in the future. 20 edits on our selected sires. We, we more than double genetic progress. If we take here, we are at something like 12, 15 uh, standard deviations of the trait, and here we're up to mid-30s. Uh, and at any point along this figure, we have doubled genetic progress. So even after a short number of generations, we've doubled genetic progress. So I think this is a positive result. Obviously, this is a simulation, so things are simplified quite a bit. Um, but uh, what really needs to drive this is in what we call industrial scale fine mapping, where we can use the capacity of genomic selection to generate massive data sets. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of individuals phenotyped with imputed sequence, which is feasible in large scale animal breeding programs. With those huge data sets, we can do fine mapping, and then we can make genome editing work even for a polygenic trait. Another thing we could think about doing is uh, inflate recombination, because if we can do fine mapping, we're not depending on LD or linkage to drive our predictions. Rather, we have the causal variants themselves. So we don't care if recombination is really high. We'll still get good predictions. In fact, we'd get better predictions, because the recombination would help the statistical model better estimate things. So recombination is the rate limiting factor in, in many aspects of genetics. Uh, uh, and in, in, For example, in, in selection, recombination gives rise to new permutations of our causal variants. And if we have lots of new permutations, we have a lot more probability of finding a permutation that is better than the current generation. So that's how we make genetic progress. So recombination is rare, but it's under genetic and environmental control, so we can, we can manipulate it. And in this example, we've just used genome editing. So we have a simulation, which it sounds, all this sounds a bit easy, but it actually was quite difficult to tweak the simulation to get it to work. So 20 generations, 50 animals per generation, we're going to select five sires, 100 QTL from a normal distribution, so pseudo-polygenic. We're going to select using the true breeding value uh, because it's just a small simulation. We can't get the accuracy to be 1. We need the accuracy to be 1 to make this work. And we have a genome length that's either 1,000 morgans or 1 morgan. So this is probably off the scale uh, in terms of uh, being too long, but I think it just it shows the point. So uh, here we have um, the red line would be the genetic gain in standard deviations of the trait uh, for the 1,000 morgans versus 1 morgan. So we're making more genetic progress if we have more uh, recombination, which is a good thing. But more importantly, we're losing genetic variation at a lower rate. So when we make selection, we, you know, over time exhaust variation, which is why we need projects like the Seeds of Discovery to bring in new genetic variation. But you can also utilize your genetic variation in a better way. So we can have inflator recombination, lose it at a lower rate. And if we, if we imagine losing it at a lower rate, that means we can increase selection intensity. So we can put this blue line, which is the loss in variance, we can put that on top of the red line. And that would allow us to push the selection intensity up, which would move this red line even further. So in essence, we believe that this is something else that's worth uh, pursuing. So the conclusions from this are, are that GS works in animal breeding. Mechanisms are understood. It will generate huge data sets. And given it will generate huge data sets, we need to think about what we will do next. Thank you for some acknowledgement.
Thank you. Do we have one question? Again, down to the wire. <laughs> Harry. Uh, in one of your slides, you did mention that uh, the breeding value of candidates would be equal to mean milk yield of uh, uh, progenies. My understanding is that breeding value is really twice of the deviations yeah, from the population a, mean. So, yeah. No, but, but, but it would be very different. For instance, if you have a candidate bull and, and, and say 50 cows, and 50 cows yield, for instance, 20 liters a day, and then the progeny yield about 25, then price of the deviation would be only 10 rather than 25. So your estimated breeding value by this way would be much, much higher than the real breeding value. And that's why when in last you said there's true breeding value. So perhaps, what true breeding value would be twice of the deviations from the population mean yeah, rather than the mean of the population? Yeah, but the process of making any progress, the exact definition doesn't matter, it's the relative, it's the relative, it's the to my brother, what is the relative? Just uh, to simplify. Okay. I have a question here. Uh, within the training population, how is the extent of trait variability and the genetic distance matters in the prediction? Within the training population, how is the extent of genetic variability and the, gen the genetic distance and the trait variability within the training population, how it will going to affect the prediction? Yeah. Genetic distance, you mean relationships? Uh, genetic distance within the training population, the candidates. Okay, so, yeah, within the training population, it is better to... It is better to have more diversity because more diversity gives you a better ability to estimate QTL effects or marker effects, but that's very much a second order effect. Okay, but uh, when you have mentioned that with the breeding population, the relatedness, I think uh, that will going to predict well. 